Hello everyone, this is Professor Paul, and thank you for watching. This is a video called Close Reading the Werewolf. What I'm going to do is take you through uh, a detailed reading of the first couple paragraphs of the werewolf as an exercise in showing you how to take um, a few words and get a lot of ideas from them. So, what is close reading? Um, it's really the foundational technique of literary study. It's one of the main things that we're trying to learn in this course and practice is how to close read. And when you're close reading something, your emphasis is on the details, on the individual details, and on the particular rather than the general. So it's sort of the opposite of doing a plot summary in that you're going to look at how does each and every detail work to build um, a larger meaning and contribute to the meaning that the that the and the meanings that the story is generating. So when you're close reading, you pay attention to individual words, phrases, to their syntax, that is how the words are put together, what order that they're put together, and all other aspects of language use. So poetic devices, imagery, repetition, any so, anything that distinguishes the way words are used. And your purpose is, we often talk about it as unfolding or unpacking the text. That is, if the text has a certain obvious uh, meaning expressed through the literal words, close reading unpacks all the suggestions, implications, hints, um, the multiple meanings that are underneath or within the text as written. So let's look at the beginning of the werewolf. I'll read the first couple paragraphs. It is a northern country. They have cold weather. They have cold hearts. Cold, tempest, wild beasts in the forest. It is a hard life. Their houses are built of logs, dark and smoky within. There will be a crude icon of the virgin behind a guttering candle. The leg of a pig hung up to cure. A string of drying mushrooms. A bed, a stool, a table. Harsh, brief, poor lives. So let's proceed sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase, even word by word. Beginning with the title. The title is The Werewolf. Well, what is a werewolf? What images or ideas do you associate with a werewolf? A werewolf, of course, is something that is a human that turns into a monster, turns into an animal. So it crosses over the barrier between human and animal. It is neither fully human nor fully animal. And so that makes it something of a monster, this hybridity. And what expectations does it create for you if you hear the title of the story is The Werewolf? Well, you expect that you're going to see a werewolf, right? And that the werewolf's going to do something important, something probably violent and bloody having to do with its wolf-like nature. It is a northern country. They have cold weather. They have cold hearts. Well, notice that there's a bit of repetition here. They have cold weather. They have cold hearts. That repetition always tells us this is something to pay attention to. What does this statement tell us? It tells us both literally about the setting, what it's like there, but also it tells us about the characters in this world. What's the connection between them? We know it's in the north. We know it's cold. So they literally have cold weather. That means there's ice, snow, that sort of thing. But they have cold hearts. That's not talking about their physical traits, but it's talking about their psychological traits or their emotional traits. So the weather outside is cold, meaning harsh, perhaps. I mean, implying that it's harsh. It literally means cold. But if their hearts are cold as well, that implies these are people who are not quick to emotion. Perhaps they themselves are also harsh and tough and that their setting, their surroundings have made them so. <clears throat> cold, tempest, wild beasts in the forest. Note the repetition here, cold. So it's emphasizing the cold, that this is an important thing to know about this place. And notice the, sen the syntax or the structure of this sentence. It's actually not a proper grammatical sentence. It's just a words, descriptions. It's cold. There's a tempest. There are wild beasts in the forest. But it doesn't say there are. It just gives you the names. So just throwing the words out there 
suggesting their inescapable presence. But also, there's a certain simplicity here. It's just telling us this is what there is. Not a lot of flowery description. Suiting with the rather harsh context, harsh setting. It is a hard life. Their houses are built of logs, dark and smoky within. So again, tells us about the setting, gives us very literal description of what it looks like. But it's not just about saying what it looks like or describing what their lives are like. It's about setting expectations. What does this help us to understand about the characters that we're going to read about? Well, that they have a difficult life, that their world is tough, that their world is unpleasant, that it's simple, that these are people who live a, a, a simple, almost we might say primitive lifestyle from our modern perspective. There will be a crude icon of the Virgin behind a guttering candle. Notice the sort of odd description, there will be, as opposed to there is or there was, the way we're more often used to being, having a language described. Um, there will be, almost makes it sound like this is a camera leading us or a tour guide leading us through this. Here you'll see a crude icon. Here you will see this. And what is a crude icon of the Virgin? Well, it's an image of the Virgin Mary. And it's crude because this is a simple place. This isn't a fancy, well-made um, image, painting. It's crudely carved, perhaps not even as impressive as this one here. And it's behind a guttering candle, a candle that's been burning out. So what are the most important words in this image? To me, crude, guttering, but also virgin. Because what does it tell us about them? Well, they're religious people, perhaps even superstitious people if they have crude icons, but they're definitely religious people. They have certain spiritual values or institutional religious values that they keep around their home, but they don't have the money, obviously, the wealth to have impressive churches, fancy paintings, etc., etc. The leg of a pig hung up to cure, a string of drying mushrooms, a bed, a stool, a table, harsh, brief, poor lives. So again, just a list of things, not even really statements, just a list of items. And what's important about the items listed? Well, they're all things that are pretty mundane, that are necessary for survival. It's food, the simple things, food, some place to sleep, some place to rest. Nothing fancy here. And no description of what the bed or stool or table looks like because they're probably not really much to look at. And notice that repetition of bed, stool, table, harsh, brief, poor, creates a kind of rhythm setting us up to, again, understand the lives of these characters as simple, difficult, tough lives and tough people living these lives. To these upland woodsmen, the devil is as real as you or I. More so, they have not seen us, nor even know that we exist. But the devil they glimpse often in the graveyards, those bleak and touching townships of the dead, where the graves are marked with the portraits of the deceased in the naive style, and there are no flowers to put in front of them. No flowers grow there. So they put out small votive offerings, little loaves, sometimes a cake that, be that the bears come lumbering from the margins of the forest to snatch away. At midnight, especially on Valpurgisnacht, the devil holds picnics, picnics in the graveyards and invites the witches. Then they dig up the fresh corpses and eat them. Anyone will tell you that. So we're going to move through this second paragraph a little more quickly. Um, larger chunks here. To these upland woodsmen, the devil is as real as you or I. What do you notice about the narrator here and the relationship that the narrator creates between us as readers themselves and the characters? Well, we've got this sort of triangulation. The narrator is on our side. We're the ones looking at these crude, primitive people. They're on the other side of the page, you might say. They're on the other side of the camera and we're looking at them. But just as they are the fictional characters that we read about, we are sort of fictional to them. They don't know who we are. They're not even aware of us, but they are aware of the devil. 
The devil is a real presence in their life in a way that we aren't. So it draws a sort of boundary between us and their world. And by introducing the devil into the story, well, now we've all of a sudden gone just from a harsh, crude, primitive place to now a supernatural, dangerous place. A place with some magic involved. More so, that is, the devil is more real than we are to them. They have not seen us nor even know that we exist, but the devil they glimpse often in the graveyards. So what does this tell us about the setting and the characters? Well, it tells us perhaps that, that if this is real, which we can assume it is, it's real in their world at least, that this is, a, again, a mysterious, magical, supernatural, and dangerous place if the devil is cavorting about frequently. And they see the devil quite often. So these people are in close touch with the devil. We could read that merely as superstition, but I think it makes more sense, given the story, to read it as real. And it furthers the divide between us and their world, right? The devil is more real to them than we are because they see the devil. They don't see us. They don't know that we exist. It's a kind of an interesting reversal, too, when you think about it, because normally we're the real ones and the characters in the story are fictional here it's the other way around from their perspective the devil is real and we're just phantoms that exist off in some other dimension we're not real to them and of course the setting is the graveyard so we might think about the ideas that the setting promotes as a specific place within this this world the graveyard as a specific type of location within this otherwise harsh cold upland uh world and the the graveyard is referred to as a blue those bleak and touching townships of the dead so there's an interesting reversal here again another reversal that the the graveyard is like a township of the dead it's like this town where the dead live so to speak so it's an inversion it's an opposite of the normal world of the real world of the living world so just as our world is the flip side of the story's world, within the story, there's the town and then there's the graveyard, which is its underworld, we might say. Where the graves are marked with portraits of the deceased in the knife style, and there are no flowers to put in front of them. No flowers grow there. So if they mark the portraits of their grave, but again, they're simple, naive, knife style, it's a simple style, what does that tell us about the characters? What does it tell us about their values? Well, they have a connection to their dead, as most cultures do. But they have, uh, it's enough to be mentioned in the story that these characters have a certain connection to their deceased and they value them. But it also gives us some, tells us something harsh about the landscape. No flowers grow there, right? That is both literal because it is too cold the landscape and the, the weather is too harsh for, for flowers, but also metaphorically, symbolically, no flowers grow there. The beauty that we associate with flowers is missing from this landscape. So they put out small votive offerings, little loaves, sometimes a cake. Again, telling us about the characters and their values, that they care about those in the world, in the afterworld. They give offerings. They think that they have a connection to the dead. They're not just dead and gone, but they need to pay respect, pay, show love, show their gratitude to their deceased, to their ancestors. Perhaps to ask them for help, as many cultures do. They'll ask the deceased for help to talk to God on their behalf. So again, tells us they're religious, maybe even what we might call superstitious, depending on our own set of values and beliefs. And what happens to those votive offerings? Well, the bears come lumbering from the margins of the forest to snatch away. Notice the language here, from the margins of the forest. So what does this tell us about life in this world? Well, we've got the town and we've got the forest. We've got the beasts in the forest, but do they stay there? No, they emerge from their forest and come into our world or come into the character's world. They take away their food. Just as in a certain way, the werewolf is an animal emerging out of a human. It's the dark animal with inside the human, symbolically speaking. 
that crosses over from wilderness. So the bears cross over. So what does this tell us about life in this world? Well, it's a difficult, dangerous place. It's a place where the boundaries between the civilized and the uncivilized, between the human and the animal, those boundaries are not so strictly defined. And that repeats, and again, reinforces earlier ideas about the, the difficulties in this world, the dangerousness of it, the supernatural element in this world. That the boundaries, again, between life and death, human and animal, civilized and uncivilized are not so strictly drawn. At midnight, especially on Valpurgis night, so notice here we're getting a very specific setting, a particular night and a particular time of day or time of evening, midnight, the darkest point of night. And Valpurgis night, it's uh, uh, the name of a, a, like a witch's night. It's a name for a, the night of a demonic celebration. So we're getting a very specific night here. It's the opposite of day. It's the exact opposite, the darkest time of night, the deepest time of night, in contrast to the daytime life, what happens in light. This is where dark things come out. The devil holds picnics, picnics in the graveyards and invites the witches. So what's the word that's most surprising in this phrase? To me, it's picnic. Because picnic is normally something we associate with pleasant. Let's, we go out into the forest or into the woods or a nice uh, field and you have a picnic. It's a relaxing, romantic thing. It's fun. It's beautiful. But this is a picnic with the devil and witches in the graveyards in an unpleasant, dark place and in the middle of the night. So it's the opposite of what we'd expect, just like the graveyard is the, is the township of the dead. It's the opposite of our normal ex expect, yeah, expectation. Then they dig up fresh corpses and eat them. So what ideas from earlier in the story are we reinforcing here? And it's not just the ideas of the danger and the supernatural, but the idea of consumption, the idea of food. We've seen food earlier votive offerings, the pig leg hanging up. And what is the food that the devil eats? Well, we are the food. Humans are the food that the devil eats. So everything is a meal for someone else. Anyone will tell you that. What's the narrator's tone with that last phrase? It's almost matter of fact. Well, anyone will tell you that. Don't you know that? How stupid are you that you don't know that the devil and his which girlfriends come and eat gr eat uh, corpses from the graveyard. Everyone knows that. So it suggests that this world, which is very strange from our perspective, this is just what's natural for them. This is part of their everyday life. This is something that they just simply accept. So let's sum up and look at some of the main ideas that we've talked about here. Um, one of the things that's really emphasized in these first paragraphs is that we've got a cold, harsh landscape and a cold, harsh life. Those are two things that are repeated over and over again. So that's very important to our understanding of the story. And also what's reinforced is the connection between setting and character. That the setting, that the world that these people are in influences who they are. It shapes who they are. It tells us about who these people are and what their lives are like. And they have, again, a simple, crude lifestyle. And that suggests something perhaps simple and crude about their mindsets, about their mentalities as well. And that there's strong supernatural and religious elements in this story. Supernatural imagery, religious imagery, not just as background, but as a main component to the story. Also, we saw a repetition in Angela Carter's writing style, a lot of repetition of simple phrases, simple structures, and by writing in that simple way, it reinforces the simplicity as well as the kind of mundane repetitiveness of the lifestyle. Rather than just saying there are people who have a mundane, simple lifestyle that is repetitive, it says a table, a stool, a bed, brief, harsh, poor lives. That embodiment of their repetitive lifestyle in the language itself is how she communicates without directly communicating. 
Uh, also notice the theme of hybridity and crossing boundaries, the werewolf that is both man and animal, the bears that come out of the forest into the human world, the devil that leaves his uh, devilish realm of hell and comes to our earth, right? All these people crossing boundaries, things crossing boundaries, being where they're not supposed to be. And some inversions, right? The human becoming animal, the animal becoming human, the bears taking our food, the graveyard that is also a town, the devil that holds picnics but at midnight. So these inversions where one thing becomes something else in a rather unexpected twist. These are all themes and moves and ideas that we're going to see repeated throughout the story. So they're set up in each and every sentence as we move through, sentence by sentence, word by word, the author's setting up these ideas um, and will develop them throughout the rest of the story. So let's close with some tips on close reading. First, you want to focus on the details. Look at each word, anything that seems important, that seems significant. You want to focus on those details and you want to proceed slowly and deliberately. You can go even slower than we've gone in this. Uh, uh, example to really proceed through and think through all the possibilities of what's being implied by these different words and phrases. Be curious, ask questions. What is this telling me about this character? What is this telling me about the setting? Why, how is the setting important? Why is it going on about this particular detail? What does that tell me? What does that suggest I should keep a, a lookout for in the rest of the story? Look up unusual words like Valpurgisnacht or naif or votive, any word that you might not know the meaning of or think it means something different in this context, look it up. And consider multiple meanings. Consider how one word might mean a number of different things, uh, because oftentimes that's how writers are clever, are creative, is that the same word or the same image can carry multiple meanings. And finally, make connections to other texts and ideas. What does it remind you of? Does it remind you of other things? So the devil obviously is going to bring up all sorts of images um, from the Bible, all sorts of religious contexts. And always think expansively, not reductively. That is, don't try to say, well, what does the pig leg symbolize? The pig leg symbolizes X. It's not about the one-to-one -one kind of connection like that. It's rather, what does it tell us about these characters that they're, that they have in their house, a pig leg hanging up to cure, mushrooms, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's not that the pig leg symbolizes something particularly, it's that the pig leg is opening us up to a wider understanding of what's going on. So that's the end of this close reading video. There'll be another one on um, the Company of Wolves, the other story in uh, uh, Angela Carter's Little Red Riding Hood uh, series. Um, so we'll see you at that video, and I wish you the day you wish yourselves. Take care.